Glitch. It's um, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm coming from the Robinson Treaty and Treaty 9 and Treaty 3 areas in Northern Ontario. And so I'm very happy to be here in Treaty 6 territory. Um, one uh, thing, when Heather was talking, it, it uh, reminded me of uh, recently uh, an exchange we had in a board meeting I was in, we have, and, and it was on Rainy Lake in uh, northwestern Ontario, which is kind of the heart of an Anishinaabe territory in that area. And we were talking about um, renewing our connections with the indigenous peoples in the area. And one of the people on our board is an Anishinaabe man from one of the communities around Rainy Lake. And so we were talking about language. And... Um, whether we should be talking about the Ojibwe or the Chippewa, as they're called in the United States, or Anishinaabe. And uh, Dennis, Dennis Jones's teaching for us that day was that Anishinaabe means the people. And what that means is that we are all Anishinaabe. And there's a way of life associated with being Anishinaabe that has a lot to do with the things that Heather was talking about. So I just wanted to tell that story before I moved on. So we are in Ontario um, trying to implement a standalone Indigenous standard for registered professional foresters. As here, you have competencies as a professional uh, forester that you're required to maintain. And um, a lot of those competencies are related to your practice as a forester. It could be forest management planning, silviculture, um, it could be policy. Uh, there's a whole range of things that are associated with the practice of doing forestry. And um, the OPFA decided that it was time to make sure that all registered professional foresters understood their responsibility uh, and obligations to protect Aboriginal and treaty rights. So when I started this, we talk about issues. And what we've talked about in the past is, and what we're most comfortable talking about is uh, bringing Indigenous people into our economic system so that they can share in benefits, economic development. Everybody's quite comfortable talking about that. And people are also quite comfortable talking about participation. So in forest management planning, we have a way of doing things where we're required to go out to the public and consult about the goals that we set for planning and the practices that we're going to put in place in our forest operations. Um, but it's more than that. It's more than participation in planning, and it's more than economic development. We have legal obligations in this country that were set out in the Constitution Act in 1980, uh, of 1982 in Section 35, and that's the commitment to recognize and affirm Aboriginal and treaty rights. I used to always say this to my students when I asked how many people have ever read the Canadian Constitution. Anyone in the room ever read the Constitution Act? Ah, yes, a couple of hands, because oh, that's great, good news. Um, so that constitution is the law, that, the highest law of the land that was put in place to enable us to live together in this so-called country called Canada. And so these are the highest principles of how we are going to live together in Canada. And in 1982, Section 35 was put into place that recognized the particular and unique place of Indigenous peoples in this country. And so we have legal obligations. And so the number one thing, as any professional would attest to, is our, uh, we need to uphold the laws of the land. And this Constitution is the highest law of the land. But there's also an Indigenous perspective on this. And that is that Indigenous peoples have inherent rights that do not need to be recognized by any other government. They flow from the Creator. Um, they're based on historic occupation and use of the territory, the land across the country. And it's uh, based on governance systems and social orders that were in place before colonization. And central to that idea of inherent rights is the right to self-determination. 
So we're seeing that right to self-determination recognized now in various ways. Internationally, probably the biggest um, change that we've seen is the, the passing of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is founded on that concept of self-determination. It also embodies a principle called free prior and informed consent. And that is before any development occurs, acknowledging Indigenous Peoples' right to self-determination require seeking their consent before any development occurs. So we're on a spectrum in this country around consultation. Um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the legal aspects of that. But consultation so far has run the gamut from if rights are going to be infringed just a little, then the consultation might need to be only information provided all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which is where um, any development will severely infringe Aboriginal rights and there's a strong strength of claim by those Indigenous peoples, consent might be required. But the consent issue has not really come full blown into our consultation processes yet. We're still at a place where we're talking with each other uh, we're listening to Indigenous people's concerns about the impacts of development on their rights, but we're not committed yet to seeking their consent. It's going to be interesting to watch what happens over the next few years with the Government of Canada talking about the implementation of the UN Declaration and FPIC. The Government of Alberta was the first to say that they were going to review all their, in, their legislation in light of UNDRIP and try and bring that legislation in line with, um, with UNDRIP principles. That hasn't happened yet. I, I'm not sure. Maybe I can learn more about what's going on here um, and where the process is at uh, with, with the government recognition of UNDRIP. And we've recently seen the province of British Columbia make the commitment with Indigenous peoples, so they've jointly, they've co-developed this idea that they're going to implement UNDRIP in British Columbia, and they're just starting that process, but based on joint negotiations with Indigenous representatives. So what's this legal thing all about? Um, we know that this has evolved over time, um, probably uh, beginning with the Calder decision in 1973 where this concept of Aboriginal title was recognized. And Aboriginal title is a unique form of land ownership that is held only by Indigenous peoples. And it's based on that idea of inherent rights, prior occupancy to colonization, and the concept of self-determination. So this is the, 1973 was what turned Pierre Trudeau around from saying we want a just society where we are all treated equally to acknowledging that indigenous peoples had a unique and special role in the country. And as a result of that, he started a process uh, called the Comprehensive Land Claim Policy, which um, put in place um, a way to enter into negotiations with indigenous peoples who did not already have treaties with, um, with the crown. And so that was a watershed moment. In, uh, and when the Constitution Act was repatriated in 1982, Trudeau listened to the indigenous peoples who were at the table and put in place section 35, uh, recognized and affirming Aboriginal and treaty rights. So after that, things started to change. What does it mean to recognize and affirm Aboriginal and treaty rights? That's what the Constitution says, but I mean, no one knew what that meant. And, and where do you start? So what ended up happening was it was the Supreme Court of Canada that, that essentially took a kind of um, what was a sort of wide open question and started to put some meaning behind it. What does it mean to recognize and affirm Aboriginal and treaty rights? Well, through a number of court cases, it came down to the idea that the Crown had to consult with Indigenous peoples in order to ensure minimal infringement of their Aboriginal and treaty rights and accommodate them in if those rights were to be infringed. So that's where the idea of the duty to consult and accommodate came from. 
And um, at the time, most of these cases were taking place in British Columbia. Uh, Van Der Peet, Sparrow, Delgamuk, Haida decision, uh, Taku River, all of these uh, major Supreme Court of Canada cases were in British Columbia where there were very few agreements with the Crown. So most of British Columbia had not entered into any kind of arrangements with, with First Nations. There were the Douglas Treaties around Vancouver Island, and that was the extent of it. And at one point, when they started the modern-day treaty-making process in British Columbia, there was um, some numbers out there that said about 110% of the land in British Columbia was under claim by First Nations. And that was because of overlapping claims. So these processes have been going on for a while. And what happened with the Supreme Court of Canada cases was that in areas where there were historic treaties, the Crown, mainly provincial governments, denied any responsibility to upholding Section 35. And that was because they said, if those BC cases apply only to areas where there are no agreements with the Crown. In areas where we have historic treaties, the Crown was saying those treaties were about giving up lands and resources. That Indigenous peoples, after they signed those historic treaties, no longer had any rights to any decision making about their lands and territories. So the world gets um, upturned in 2005 with the Miccosu decision in Alberta, in, in that was the Treaty 8 area. And essentially that case was a wake-up call for provinces where there were historic treaties because what the Supreme Court of Canada says, uh, said was the duty to consult and accommodate applies equally to historic treaty areas as it does to areas where there are no agreements with the Crown. And so, uh, where I come from, Northern Ontario, it's all historic treaties. In fact, the Robinson treaties along Lake Superior, the Robinson Superior and Robinson Huron treaties became the model for all of the numbered treaties that spread out across the, uh, Western Canada. Treaty 3, Treaty 6, Treaty 1, Treaty 2, 1 through 11, Treaty 9 in, North, in Northern Ontario. And those treaties had language in them that talked about um, ceding and surrendering, surrendering lands and um, resources in exchange for establishment of reserves and the right to continue a way of life, hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering on what was called unceded crown territory with the right of the crown to take up land from time to time for lumbering, mining, settlement, and other purposes. And so what we saw happen across the country was that provincial governments in the period between 1850 when the Robinson Treaties were signed and 1930 when the last adhesion to Treaty 9 was signed, those pr pr provincial governments stepped in and just started taking up land for mining, settlement, forestry, and other purposes until every last square inch of land was taken up. And what did that mean? Um, did, did that mean that indigenous communities gave up their rights to, to their lands and resources and their way of life? Um, and did the Crown continue to have a, a, an obligation to consult with them? Well, further cases like especially um, Grassy Narrows following Mikasu, uh, there was a question there about whether the province of Ontario had the right to issue forest licenses to companies on treaty land. And Grassy Narrows First Nation contended that no, the province did not have that right, that that was a federal responsibility. And I, I can go on and on about these things, but constitutional um, uh, conflicts between the federal government and provincial governments has been an ongoing story about the the place we call Canada. And there's always been this power struggle going on. But the Constitution gives the federal government responsibility for Indians and lands reserved for Indians. It gives provinces responsibility for natural resources within provincial boundaries. So what happens when you're dealing with indigenous people's interests in lands and resources when it comes to things like forestry, mining, settlement, 
this was constant back and forth, passing the buck over the years with neither level of government taking any responsibility. So um, the Grassy Narrows case, Grassy Narrows wanted to stick to the, the, what they considered the strict letter of the Constitution that the federal government had responsibility for Indians and lands reserved for Indians. And if any development was going to occur, then the federal government needed to step in and protect the rights of, of those indigenous peoples. But the Supreme Court of Canada clarified that no, it is the province of Ontario and only Ontario that has the right to issue forest licenses. And that is because those responsibilities are laid out also in the Constitution Act, along with Section 35. So, what the court, Supreme Court of Canada clarified, though, again, following Mikasu, was that if Ontario in issuing forest licenses was going to infringe on Aboriginal and treaty rights, they had the duty to consult and accommodate. And then we've got all kinds of court cases that go on to put more meat on what is meaningful consultation. And I'm not going to go into that because I think probably a lot of the other speakers are going to be talking about uh, what meaningful consultation is and how that works. So um, in, in terms of other watershed moments, what we've had recently in 2015 was the national acknowledgement of the harm that was done to Indigenous peoples by the establishment of the residential school system, a system that was designed to um, take the Indian out of the child. Uh, to assimilate Indigenous peoples into the greater Canadian society so there would no longer be any kind of what uh, Scott called Indian problem. And that residential school system had an enormous impact on Indigenous peoples. And as a result, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established in, in two, uh, 2015. They came up with their report with 92 uh, calls for action, which was a wake-up call, I think, for the country acknowledging the harm that had been done, and then looking at ways that we were going to move forward. Uh, and, and of course, reconciliation is the end goal. So one of the major recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples with recognition of Indigenous Peoples' right to self-determination and embracing the principle of free prior and informed consent. They also talked about the need to educate Canadians, and they, you know, there were sections for lawyers and educators. Um, there was one particular call for action, uh, section 57, that called for the training of public servants on, I'm quoting, the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the UN Declaration, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law, and Aboriginal crown relationships and that this requires skill-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. So um, this is some of the context for what led the Ontario Professional Foresters Association to consider a standalone Indigenous standard. It's our way of meeting the commitments uh, or the calls to action of the, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So let's look a little bit at this history of what we've done in terms of educating people about Indigenous rights uh, over the last, I can't believe that, it's 20, 20 years. Um, so I was hired at Lakehead University in the Faculty of Natural Resources Management in 2000. And I was hired uh, in particular to develop Indigenous programming within the faculty. Uh, I'm taught, and so what I did in my first year of teaching in 2001, I worked with a small group of students in a kind of seminar, seminar style setting, because there were only 10 of them, um, to develop a course on Indigenous peoples and natural resources. So I co-developed the course with the students and developed a framework that I've used in my teaching over the last um, 17 years. And other forestry schools also began to address indigenous issues. I wrote an article in the um, Forestry Chronicle in 2002 
uh, which was a survey of all of the forestry schools across Canada looking at how did they implement indigenous rights into their curriculum. And I'm uh, through this process with the OPFA, I want to update that article and we've got a call out to deans of the forestry schools across Canada asking how have they, how are they doing it now? It's been almost 20 years. How have things changed? Has, has it improved? Let's take another look at how well we're doing in this area. So in 2001 was the first year I taught the Indigenous Peoples and Natural Resources course. It was still an elective. So only had 10 students in that first intake. And in about 2004, I can't remember exact year, it became a required course. And it's the only uh, required course that I know of in any forestry school across Canada that is solely um, directed to Indigenous rights issues and natural resources. Other forestry schools uh, will incorporate Indigenous issues in, a, in another course. They'll do it through other ways, like these kinds of events where they're bringing people together to talk about Indigenous issues. People have hired um, uh, ab Aboriginal coordinators within their faculties. There's been a whole series of ways that schools have tried to do this. So that's been ongoing over the last 20 years. In um, the Canadian Forestry Accreditation Board has academic standards for all these forestry schools, and they have to meet these standards in order to keep their accreditation. And the accreditation allows them to graduate students who then go on to become registered professional foresters. So uh, in 2018, the Canadian Forestry Accreditation Board brought into place a new set of academic standards. And even though there had been some discussion about doing a standalone Indigenous standard at that national level, CFAB, for whatever reason, decided not to pursue that. Uh, so what they've done now is included it in Standard 7, which is um, planning and administration. And under 7.2, it says, identify societal factors, governance, and regulations in your work, including Indigenous Peoples' Treaty and other rights, claims, traditions, and interests. So every forestry school, when they go to get their accreditation renewed, has to demonstrate that they are doing this. In 2016, the Association of BC Forest Professionals brought in a, a new approach, um, and they called it the six experience um, modules, that one of which included BC forest professionals working with Aboriginal communities. So they were the first professional uh, foresters Association that brought in explicit content that their uh, registered professional foresters had to meet in order to become RPFs. That is currently under revision and so we've been in discussion with that association um, to look at how they're approaching it and to see whether we can coordinate some of our work. So in 2017, the Ontario Professional Foresters Association passed a resolution at its council meeting, and that was that council provide to the Canadian Federation of Professional Forestry Associations recommended revisions for comp to competency elements of the 2017 certification standards to reflect the need for Indigenous traditional knowledge. Well, we've gone a little bit beyond that motion in terms of our decision to develop a standalone Indigenous standard that looks not just at traditional knowledge, but also at the rights and self-determination and free prior and informed consent issues. So we have a committee that was struck of, um, from the OPFA, and uh, we have uh, Fred Pinto, who's the executive director, Peter Street, who's the president of, of the OPFA, Gord King, who's an OPFA counselor, David Flood from the Tatchewan First Nation, and uh, he runs a company called Wakatoan uh, Development. Larry McDermott, who is um, considered an elder, is a public member of the OPFA Council, and he's from Shabajwan First Nation. Louise Simpson, who's the OPFA Registration Manager, and Erin Knight, who has uh, just completed her undergraduate degree at Lakehead in Honors Bachelor of Environmental Management. So um, it's a, a strong committee with, with strong Indigenous representation. And so we've gone through the process in the last year of uh, putting together an, uh, a standard. 
that's been shared with professional associations across Canada and with the deans of, of the different forestry schools. And in May, we had our OPFA annual general meeting, and there we presented the standard, and we'd also sent it out earlier for feedback from our members, and it was presented to the uh, membership at the, at the AGM. So um, in terms of what's in it, uh, the standard is called the Indigenous Peoples, Lands, and Resources, and the principle, uh, basic principle, is managing forest resources requires RPFs to understand Aboriginal and treaty rights as outlined in Section 35 of Canada's Constitution Act, how those rights may be affected by forestry operations, how Indigenous knowledge can contribute to sustainable forest management, and the responsibility of RPFs to recognize and affirm Aboriginal treaty rights and respect Indigenous knowledge systems. So that's the underlying um, principle. And I just wanted to say, if anybody is burning to ask a question in the, in the middle of all of this, feel, just feel free to put your hand up. And I don't mind stopping. And, um, so the standard has gone from four to three uh, dis dem what we call demonstrable competencies. I'm sorry for the language, but that's what the accreditation folks call it, and so we've adopted the language. Uh, so the first demonstrable competency is demonstrate knowledge of Indigenous peoples, their worldviews, knowledge, governance, including protocols for engagement and practices related to, to lands and resources. To describe the nature of Aboriginal and treaty rights, including interpretations of Supreme Court of Canada rulings and Indigenous communities, and explain their re relevance to forest development, management, and conservation. And three, identify how the roles and responsibilities of stakeholders at the local, provincial, federal, international, and private sector and non-governmental levels affect Indigenous peoples' forest-based rights including those on crown and private lands and indigenous traditional territories. Phew, eh? So just to give you an idea about some of the things, we've got long lists of, of what we think should be covered under these three uh, de demonstrable competencies. So for the first one, we're looking at the basic issues. Who are indigenous peoples? the history and impacts of colonization on indigenous peoples, uh, historical and contemporary um, information about indigenous worldviews, the importance of traditional ecological knowledge, protocols of engagement with indigenous groups, and personal and systemic biases in forestry. That last one being, we think is really important. I mean, given that we've had 20 years where forestry schools have been trying to bring in some education about indigenous people's rights, we need to know whether that's working or not. And as practicing professionals, we need to be self-aware, that is to understand um, where our own thinking comes from. Where do we learn the things that we learn? Um, and for for me, as an educator for 17 years, I'm hoping that all those students who are required to take my Indi Indigenous Peoples and Natural Resources course have changed their thinking as a result of that. So being aware of our personal and, and also systemic biases in forestry. For number two, we're looking at historic and modern definitions of Aboriginal and treaty rights the nature and definition of the Crown's rights and responsibilities, evolving concepts and principles of Supreme Court of Canada rulings on Aboriginal and treaty rights, and the recognition of different interpretations of those rulings. So the Supreme Court of Canada may say one thing, uh, Indigenous people may say something else, and we've got a whole debate, um, discussion going on in this country about the need to incorporate Indigenous law into our legal system. And we have scholars like John Burroughs who has been promoting this idea that as a country, Canada has based on three founding nations and we need to bring Indigenous nations into um, the way that we govern our system and not be 
stuck in a, a very kind of British model of, of justice that ignores indigenous people's worldviews. So uh, three, uh, the roles and responsibilities of stakeholders. So we're looking at international and domestic initiatives related to indigenous peoples and the environment. Uh, tr Truth and Reconciliation Commission's Call to Action 57, if you remember that was the training of public servants to understand uh, indigenous issues. Uh, indigenous, or the, pr the principles of the duty to consult and accommodate as well as free and prior informed consent as outlined in the UN Declaration. Indigenous people's roles and responsibilities in consultation. I think it was interesting that some of the feedback that we got from uh, folks about the standard was that some people have the misconception that indigenous people could, ref under Canadian law, could refuse to engage in consultation processes, which is not the case. The Supreme Court of Canada has been very clear that indigenous peoples have an obligation to engage when they are approached, as long as that consultation process is meaningful. So if it's not meaningful, there is the right to kind of refuse to participate but then the onus is on the indigenous community to prove why that process is not meaningful. Um, the nature of various agreements, stakeholders and indigenous peoples involved in the implications for Aboriginal and treaty rights and the impact stemming from development that affect indigenous people's rights. So those are the three desirable competencies. Maybe I'll just stop for a minute. And Any reactions and questions? Hi, Sandra. Thanks for the, that's not working, but I can project. Um, thanks for the presentation thus far. So on uh, calls to action 57, you mentioned public service. The calls to action for business, section 92.3, says almost the identical wording for business yeah. and the right for education. So why didn't you include 92? Um, no particular reason. Um, I'll amend the presentation when, when it's over and I'll make sure that I put that section in there. <laughs> because you're right, I just used it as a model in that we've all been called on and even though it says public servants, it's really up to everyone. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's things directed at lawyers and educators and business people. So. There's business professionals in forestry in Ontario as well. And it's interesting, we've had some interesting debates around private sector or private land and indigenous rights. And that's another whole, in fact, the, I, I do a fair bit of work with the Forest Stewardship Council. We actually, actually solicited a legal opinion recently on the application of indigenous rights on private lands. And that is evolving. So there have been some cases that have said those rights continue to exist even on private land and they have to be considered subject to things like safety and those. So the right to hunt on private land has been through the courts and uh, even though probably many indigenous people stopped hunting on private lands, there have been a few that have, have gone ahead and done that and have then taken their cases to court. I saw a hand up there, yeah. Just wondering at the beginning you said there were four principles. Yeah. And what was the fourth one that you dropped? Um, it was kind of a, 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 we just amalgamated the, the um, roles and responsibilities and the rights because we had repetition with four. So there were some rights issues that were outlined in roles and responsibilities and vice versa. So we just put them together, simplified it. There wasn't anything of substance dropped. We didn't feel like... We, it's just that there was repetition. Hey, good morning. Nice to see you. Uh, just for everybody's benefit, can you elaborate a little bit more on ethnic? It's a subject that I know is, is talked about in a lot of circles these days, and just the understanding of what pre prior and informed consent and how you think it would be applied. Um, okay, so probably the biggest debate around free prior and informed consent is whether if we embrace the concept that gives indigenous peoples a veto over any development decisions. So the veto is the um, elephant in the room. And what many indigenous peoples have said, 
over and over again, uh, we've written about this, is that consent is not a veto. Consent is about a process of engagement that is based on building relationship. And it, that relationship is one based on respect. So if you go into negotiations thinking that FPIC is about giving indigenous peoples a veto, you're not gonna go there. You're just gonna say, and in fact, that's what happened to Bill C-262, which was brought forward in the federal government by Romeo Saganash, an NDP MP, uh, who wanted, he brought in a private member's bill to implement UNDRIP. And it got all the way through to third and final reading in the Senate, and conservative senators blocked the bill, and it happened just before the election was called, so it died on the order paper. But it was that close. It had gotten approval of the House of Commons, it had gotten to third reading in Senate, and then it, it was finished. So what's gonna happen now, whether um, the minority liberal government is going to bring back a similar bill, um, I have no idea. So I'll have to wait and see. Um, but th the main debate by those conservative senators around um, approving uh, Bill C-262 was around the veto issue. You can go into the Hansards and read the minutes that, of the debate that took place and um, get an idea about this, where this idea of veto is coming from. But essentially, it's in some ways, it's a scare tactic. Um, and it's preventing us from engaging in meaningful relationships with each other at a negotiating table where we see each other as equals. And we, like, right now, if you think about it, provincial governments have a veto. Should provincial governments have a veto over the way that we develop our natural resources? I don't think they should. I think this, it's the same sort of thing. The provincial government's responsibility is to uphold the greater good um, and to look at resource development light, in light of how it is going to improve our society. Um, and it's central to that has to be better relationships with indigenous peoples. That's, I think we've gone way past that. So if we just get over the, the fear of veto, then we can look at consent as relationship building. So when you say fear, or the veto is a fear tactic, mm -hmm. by, by who? Because when we go into different Aboriginal communities, we get that exact thing. Or, or under, or ethnic is a veto. Like we're getting that told to us. Then we all need to be educated about it. And um, certainly, if you think about indigenous communities, who have not been giving a significant role in decision making, if they all of a sudden see that there's potentially some tool that is going to strengthen their voice, they're going to grab hold of it. Uh, so we, I mean, it's, it needs to have a conversation and a debate um, about it and, and back and forth learning. Did I see another hand? Yes. About the, uh, excuse me, could you mind just using the microphones because they are turned on and it's part of the video record. So if you don't mind, I'll just put the microphone, please. With the uh, federal and provincial government's interpretation of uh, infringement of treaty rights for Aboriginal uh, First Nations, whatever, what's the catch word for First Nations these, these days? Anyway, then that's what they need to establish because every time Alberta government indicates the federal government's problem, not ours, and they still go ahead and do it. So the definition of infringement has got to be applied by federal, government, federal and provincial governments. They have to define it. So of course it does infringe on our rights, especially with our um, spruce where they have to spray. The medicines aren't going to go there, go, go there for years and years again. Mm -hmm. That's infringement. And the movement of uh, animals, that's infringement. Now we have to go further. So the definition of those things have to be applied and actually well defined for any thing like veto or anything else or agreements coming into place. What First Nations really generally want is uh, co-management with, with uh, 
the um, forest. I think you have to, a long way to go because industry rules and industry pays for everything else. So it, it is going to be a tough balance in that in trying to define all those things. So that's where I think the federal and provincial government's got to come in, define what's what's uh, what's infringement and to ensure our our, our future rights to hunt fish and trap in, in our areas instead of moving around and all over. You know, I, I think um, that the, the definition of infringement of indigenous rights has to come from indigenous peoples. So I don't think that it's up to federal and provincial governments to clarify that. The duty to consult and accommodate is about the Crown entering into meaningful consultation with First Nations to understand the nature of the infringement of the rights. So defining those rights has to come. You, you're the one that has to say, these spruce stands are important places for medicines for us. We don't want to see them eradicated off the landscape. So how are we going to protect them? Or how are we going to manage them so that we continue to have our medicines while you have your timber? Those are, you know, those have to be negotiated. And I think that the, the Supreme Court of Canada has now been fairly clear that it's provincial governments with whom First Nations have to engage to make sure those rights are protected because it's provincial governments that have constitutional responsibility for natural resources management. And that's difficult for a lot of uh, First Nations um, to come to terms with because particularly when, with historic treaties, they were signed with the British Crown. And then the, Canada became a country and Canada became a representative of the British Crown. So a lot of First Nations see that as almost a sacred relationship. That's why Grassy Narrows went to court to say it's the federal government that should be looking after our rights because we entered into treaty with the British Crown and it's up to them to look after our interests. I think it is important for the federal government to clarify their role in protecting Aboriginal and treaty rights if the provincial crown doesn't do an adequate job of it. But the federal government stepped out of anything to do with natural resources management probably in the 80s when they canned the forest resource development agreements, which was federal money uh, coming as transfer payments to provincial governments to encourage things like regeneration, tree planting programs, and even indigenous programming was under those uh, forest resource development agreements. They, they were gone, and since the, the federal government has literally stepped back from any involvement in forest management at the provincial level. So, and again, it goes back to that constitutional conflict of jurisdiction that is just going to continue to plague us. So First Nations are going to have to, I think, continue to put pressure on the federal government to say, you know, what kind of involvement would you like when it, if it comes to provincial forest management decisions? Uh, how should the federal government be involved? And how will they protect your rights? Anyway, those are, it, that problem's not going away anytime soon. Okay, um, let's, how am I doing for time? Am I? Okay. So, um, I'm going to go back to, so we, we've gone through a uh, somewhat of a consultation process, and this is different than the way other standards have been developed. There hasn't been a, a necessarily a, consultation proce uh, process with um, association members around the development of academic standards. That was done at a fairly high level. Those standards were put in place. They were required by the forestry schools to meet them and the systems there. They have to renew their accreditation every five years and they go through that process. 
But we decided that it was important to get buy-in from our membership and to make sure that they understood what we were trying to do in putting forward this standalone indigenous standard. We've also, in the process, gotten uh, feedback from some of the associations, including uh, Alberta's Professional Foresters Association. So we really appreciate some of that feedback coming in from across the country, because eventually, if OPFA takes this forward, then certainly the Canadian Forestry Accreditation Board is going to need to look at doing it at a national level. Or we're, we're going to have a kind of continued piecemeal approach across the country with each provincial forestry association deciding if they're going to do this and how. Um, so we've got BC now and Ontario um, coming forward with uh, particular ways to address Indigenous rights. So I just wanted to share with you a couple of the um, issues that were raised by uh, folks. And we have ex extensive um, notes. We took every concern that was raised at the, at the OPFA AGM. We had written input, and we took and, and broke down every issue and discussed it, agreed to change things or not, and, and uh, came up with explanations. So all of that is documented, and, it, and, and I've just cherry-picked a few issues here. Um, certainly, it's not all of the issues that were raised. So the, probably the biggest one, that the, the original competen competencies were too specific and prescriptive. So one example of that would be um, we talked about the requirement to negotiate agreements, and people said, why negotiate agreements? That's a kind of a legalistic approach. And there may be other ways of doing that. And people develop relationships in all kinds of ways. It's not necessarily an adversarial negotiating table type of approach. So we took that out. And, so then, and instead of saying negotiated agreements, but it would be something like work towards mutually beneficial agreements. And how you do that then is up to you. So that was one of the examples of being too prescriptive and that we changed as a result of that. So we generalized these requirements. Uh, language w was huge because it's so political. So we had discussions about, do we use the term indigenous um, around rights issues? Section 35 talks about Aboriginal and treaty rights. It doesn't talk about indigenous rights. But we've seen uh, kind of moving forward and because largely, I think, of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and with Trudeau, in the, when, after he was elected at the national level, said we are going to adopt the term indigenous, we're not going to use Aboriginal anymore. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. There's tensions between First Nation and Métis. Um, there's um, people, neither First Nations or Métis like the term Aboriginal. People seem to be more comfortable with Indigenous. But in adopting Indigenous, does that mean we're undermining Section 35 Aboriginal and treaty rights? Because it's different language, and we're not using that constitutional language anymore. So we need, and I've heard lawyers raise this issue and say, we need to be really careful about this. Um, we talked about Indigenous land tenure. People objected to that. And because the way we look at the world is in forest management is that tenure is held by the provincial crown. And as I talked about those treaties before, the historic treaties has this language in them about ceding and surrendering land. And so provincial governments have been stuck for a long time on that issue, saying, indigenous people, you gave up your rights when you signed the treaties. You gave up your land, so you don't have any control anymore over your, ten over your territories. Of course, indigenous peoples will say just the opposite. It was never our intent when we entered into historic treaties to give up our land, and certainly not our rights, and, and that it wasn't ours to give up. These are gifts from the creator. They were given to us to look after. We have a responsibility to do that, and so we didn't give up those rights. So there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done around these differing interpretations of historic treaty rights as well. Um, some people didn't even want to see the word indigenous territories because when you've got uh, provincial crown land 
You've got First Nation reserve land, which is federally owned. You've got treaty areas where there are use rights applied under treaties, under the li literal interpretation of treaties. And you've got private land. So some people didn't, they wanted to just stick with European concepts of property ownership. Let's talk about federal, provincial, and private land. That's all we recognize. We don't recognize indigenous territories, especially under historic treaties. So lots of differences that need to be worked out, problems that haven't yet been resolved. Um, so the main thing, my point here is that one of the struggles that we have in developing this kind of standard is how do we ensure that the, both of those points of view, the differing points of view, are heard? Because we cannot just represent crown interests or private landowners' interests. The indigenous voice has to be brought into this dialogue. And so that is one of our main challenges in doing this. The, the other major concern was, are we asking too much of foresters by having them know or learn this knowledge about indigenous rights and accept some responsibility for ensuring that those rights are recognized and affirmed. Um, any thoughts on that? Are we asking too much of foresters? You, you've seen the, the desirable competencies now, the three of them, and you've seen a short list of what we were going to cover under that. Is it asking too much of foresters? I'd like to have a couple of registered professional foresters at the mic responding to that. Hey. Hi. How you doing? Good. Uh, yes, absolutely. But it shouldn't be uh, limited to foresters by any means. Uh, I was going to ask you earlier, is, is the whole concept that you're raising here, uh, educating people, ed educating people uh, in Ishnaq, uh, shouldn't that be to anyone dealing with anything regarding the use of the resources? Shouldn't it really go up? Okay, but I ch I'd challenge you, yes, it should. Uh, and it's not something that should be restricted just to registered professional foresters. But if you think about your responsibility as a registered professional forester, what does that mean? I mean, in Ontario, we have legislation that spells that out, and that our number one responsibility is to protect the public good. And to me, a major part of that responsibility would be having knowledge about um, Indigenous rights issues, because it is part of that public good. Any other RPS want to? Um, I only recently wrote my exam and passed. Thankfully. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so fresh in my mind is like RPS same and all that stuff that we have in Alberta. And I think regardless of who the people are, foresters have a responsibility to, for the greater good, you know, to um, manage the land and do what they can to recognize everyone's um, relationship with the land. And um, I think that this is just a first glance thought about what you've presented. And I think that it might be wise to require it at an educational level, but as a professional forester, I'm supposed to care for all people and all people's relationship with the land, and that would be part of that, I think. So I think that if it was part of the education, people were aware and knew that those people were out there, I think that would already be incorporated into what exists. Um, but I do think that being educated would be a good thing. I know that I had opportunities to take classes and other faculties and stuff like that, on Aboriginal rights and stuff like that, um, but it wasn't particularly accessible. And even in my personal life, we've, we've done a lot of fostering with my family, and 
we had Aboriginal children, and that wasn't particularly accessible for us as kids either. My parents had the education, but we didn't. And uh, I think just you're always better able to take care of things for the greater good, for everybody's sake, if you know. And I just think that people just don't know. So I think adding it to the CFAB requirements would be probably wise. That's my perspective so far. So are you a University of Alberta graduate? Yeah. And so did you, in terms of content within your program, were there courses where these issues were discussed? Um, there weren't. There certainly weren't courses specifically addressing the issue like the one that you developed. And I think something like that would be a good idea. Um, people, people talked about the issues for sure, but they they weren't um, necessarily issues that would impact the bottom line of your degree, like whether or not you were going to get a degree or pass your course or whatever. You know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And also, I think the program has also developed since I graduated. I, well, I know that it has. I know that there, are cha there have been changes. I don't know exactly what they are, but I know that they have changed things. Great, thank you. I just wanted to, to, say, to say one of one of the tensions in being a registered professional forester, uh, I think that's been discussed quite a bit in um, in, in, in our association meetings is the tension between your loyalties to your employer and your loyalties to the public good. I see a lot of heads nodding. So, you know, some of us work for provincial government, some of us work for federal government, some of us work in the private sector, some of us even work with non-governmental organizations, and some of us are working with First Nations. So that question of what is our professional responsibility ultimately to? Is it to our employer? And again, we've talked about it, that it's important that we understand that it's for the greater public good. And yes? Do you want me to ask? <laughs> so, I mean, I kind of have two minds to this, to this uh, question. Like, are we asking too much of foresters? So I don't think we're asking too much of foresters to learn all the stuff that you're talking about here. Where I think we ask too much of foresters is where we are often the people who are going into the communities and trying to build relations and make agreements. And I think that's a lot to ask of foresters in who are representing a company, which is basically what's happening. Um, because we get a lot of that pushback and anger. We get a lot of that, which really is more appropriately uh, directed toward the federal or the provincial government, not the company, but this delegation to, or the, the ability to delegate this consultation authority from the Crown, that makes it tough. That makes it really tough for professional forces. And I think that's what we're asking of maybe a little bit too much of them. Good point. And that, I'm not sure if everybody's aware, but it was the Haida decision in 2004 that clarified that it was the Crown's responsibility or duty to consult. That was a case against Brit Province of British Columbia and Weyerhaeuser in the transfer of a license from Macmillan Blodel to, to Weyerhaeuser. And the, the Haida Nation um, su sued both the provincial government and Weyerhaeuser, saying that they both had a duty to consult. The case clarified that the duty to consult is a Crown responsibility, and it goes back to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, uh, it talks about upholding the honor of the crown and the importance of that. And so the courts have, Supreme Court of Canada has underlined that honor of the crown and, and the requirement that it be upheld in case after case. But one of the things the Haida decision did was it said, but the crown may delegate procedural aspects of consultation to the private sector. And that has caused a lot of grief across the country because provincial governments have gone ahead and done that, delegated these procedural aspects without in some cases really having a solid, sound system of consultation in place. Um, and that was part of the, uh, there was a mining case in um, northwestern Ontario that talked about this in question about the, the 
delegation of procedural aspects. It was a lower court, but it ruled that um, the Crown had been had done the right thing because they had put in place proper oversight of that private sector company when it came to consultation. So they had mechanisms in place where they were able to go and check to see how is the company doing. We have these guidelines or principles surrounding consultation. Is the company following those? And the court acknowledged that they thought that the province of Ontario was doing an okay job at that. So anyways, I, I digress. I'm not a forester, and I'm not uh, an educator per se. I have a booth back at the, out, out there, so that's my little promo piece. But <laughs> on behalf, on behalf of, of learning for foresters, the University of Alberta Faculty of Extension has a, a free online course, which is the, I think, most widely taken course of the world as an online course. And also the Faculty of Extension has both a certificate and diploma for industry and uh, indigenous relationships. So, you know, that's, that's a way to, to get into this, get immersed, and also to be, to be learning from indigenous people and industry people and academics. So, Thank you. Faculty of Extension. Okay. Got it. What's the title? What's the title for us? I would go Faculty of Extension, U of A, Indigenous, yeah, Indigenous, Canada. <laughs> Indigenous Canada, and it'll come up. Great, thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, I was the person that Nathan pointed out as the one who came up with this idea for today. I was a, or am still in school, not currently, but I'll be graduating in April. And a big thing that I why suggested this was because of our knowledge gap at school. Like one of our things of tech sessions at CIF was trying to get more students involved, but trying to give us uh, sessions that we haven't really had before. And this was a big gap that I had. And I don't think to the question I'm not a RPF yet, but I will be. And these are going to be big tasks for us. But I do not think that this is asking too much of RPFs. It might be asking us a lot in the first five to ten years because we will be the ones fighting this forefront. But I think most of the younger generation I'm going to school with is ready to fight this fight with you guys. And so that's like kind of what I want to say is that like the people I'm going to school with right now want this. We we're fighting for this. Most people are going out of their way to take their pre electives and their approved electives to, to be taking the native study classes. And we're all strong industry supporters for the most part, but this is what we asked for is today. Thank you for that. How many students or recent grads are in the room? Do you want to raise your hands? I just wanted to point out that in Alberta, I can't speak for the other provinces, consultation is a very mixed terrain. Uh, there is no requirement in this province for impact assessments to be done for forestry operations. Um, consultation has to be done for First Nations, uh, but it's the province that decides if consultation has been adequate. Uh, there are First Nations that don't like the consultation policy, they think it's inadequate to begin with, yet they are not the ones who have the final say. There is consultation for Métis settles, but there's no consultation for Métis off settlements without a very complex process in which they have to prove their Métis and, and living in settlements of some kind, although not the official settlements. So it's very complicated, and I think that for foresters to learn this is really important because the government isn't doing it. If the government were doing a good job, it would be take some of the pressure off the industry consultants who are working with the indigenous communities and the indigenous people. But the government has really abrogated much of what it, some of us should be doing. Thank you. And you are going to hear from provincial representatives at some point today. Hi, Peggy. Hello. I took your class at Lakehead. And I really Remind me of your name. Christine Mullen, 2014. Um, so yeah, I, um, 
didn't really realize that that course was a rarity in the forestry education scene. So having come out of Lakehead and taken that course, I found it very useful going forward, um, especially coming to Alberta and working here. I learned a lot of things. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've noticed is a lot of things that people are saying is the differences between the level of engagement that we as foresters face. So if you're in private industry, you're on the front lines and you're working with these communities trying to work it out. Um, if you're a provincial, as I used to be a provincial forester um, and recently moved over to the energy sector, um, the difference being that foresters are the ones making a call on adequacy of consultation in the province um, with the advice of the Aboriginal Consultation Office. Uh, when I moved over to energy, however, that is changed. So in energy, um, we are fully yielding the decision to the Aboriginal Consultation Office. So there's a lot of different layers that foresters sort of work in in the, in the consultation scheme. So for some foresters, maybe it is too much. And for others, maybe there's a little less burden there. So it's finding kind of where that support is needed. Thank you for that. Yeah, and it is one of the issues that we're talking about, you know, going through the standard, what is it that every forester should know? And what is it that foresters are in a specialized position, maybe working directly with First Nations, what more is it that they should know? And I don't think we've quite come to terms with that yet, but yeah, it's a big issue. Um, okay, I just wanna, to, to go back, one of the things in terms of asking a question about whether we're asking too much of foresters, um, Canadian Forestry Accreditation Board uses Bloom, this Bloom's taxonomy of, uh, on how people get educated. And so we are restricting ourselves to the first two levels, and that's knowledge and comprehension. If you go uh, beyond that through the different layers of taxonomy it goes into things like application analysis synthesis evaluation we are not those might be the more specialized skills that are needed by someone working directly with first nation communities but in terms of the overall standard we're keeping it at that, those lower levels of bloom's taxonomy to knowledge and comprehension so i think i've heard a couple of people say that it might be onerous, but it's information that people need to know. And so um, the idea of, if we go back, so Blooms uses verbs. So you can see in number one, it's demonstrate. Two is describe. Three is identify. So those are fairly low level. It's not talking about analyzing, applying, evaluating, synthesizing. It's talking about description, identification, and demonstration. So um, that's you know one response to that. Are we asking foresters too much? And I just want to finish off by talking about what where we're going now, what the next steps are. We've it has gone uh, following our um, meeting in May, um, the annual general meeting of the OPFA, where we vetted this with the membership. We did um, do the revisions and uh, brought it down to three competencies rather than four. I made some changes based on the feedback that we got. And it went to OPFA Council for approval. They had some issues with language, particularly around this, are we asking too much? And is that the right verb to use or not? So we have reconsidered this and it now has to go back to OPFA Council for a second time and hopefully this next time they will approve it and we'll be able to move ahead. And then we're also committed to wider consultation, particularly with uh, Indigenous people. It's not that we need approval of this standard. We think the standard's needed and it's, we shall um, go ahead with it, but there may be some feedback that people want to give us. And we also want to simply let some of the Indigenous organizations know that we are committed to this path of reconciliation and this is the way that we've chosen to do that. So we've talked about doing a special 
a presentation to the Chiefs uh, of Ontario, which is uh, an organization that represents all of the 134 First Nations across Ontario. Um, and then the, the big part of it will be implementation. So we are going to have to make sure that we have the resources available to RPF so that they can gain this knowledge without necessarily having to go back to Lakehead University and retake my course, um, uh, which is not workable. So one of the things that we're doing is um, I am putting that course into an online open access textbook, which we think will be probably the primary resource. And I was really glad to hear about the Alberta online uh, faculty of extension course. I'm sure there's some important, uh, it's an important resource for everyone. So, and he also, there are a number of training programs that are out there and the government of Ontario has an indigenous program uh, awareness building intercultural uh, workshop that they require all of their employees to take. So we are going to be assessing some of those different training programs and to see whether they meet our desirable competencies. So those are our next steps. Um, I'm open for any more questions if you have any or time's up. Uh, no, we have uh, nine minutes for questions. Okay, so comments or questions. And I really appreciate the input so far. It's been great. Mm -hmm.